Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Grace Church. Uh, my name is Slade. I'm taking over for Pastor Jim this week. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I love church history, and that's what we're going to be talking about again. Um, so I'm very excited. This is like my jam. Uh, I'm a big believer in the, the importance of history, especially church history. Um, it gives us kind of a foundation and a consistency um, to what we believe in our faith. Uh, it reminds us that we are not alone, um, and it keeps us centered and going on the right path, I believe. Um, our goal here is to provide kind of a broad overview of the past 2,000 years. We're not really getting into the nitty-gritty of everything, um, but the goal is to kind of maybe inspire you to kind of dig a little deeper yourself uh, as, as we go forward. Um, I'll be leading the class for the next four weeks uh, as Pastor Jim works on his sermon, um, as uh, uh, Michael will be on sabbatical next month, so Jim will be preaching and so I'm going to be kind of taking over for a while. Uh, and as we go along, we want to look at church history from a specific perspective. Um, Pastor Jim talked about this idea of chronological humility as opposed to chronological snobbery. And the idea is that we want to look in the past um, with humility and understanding. Um, these people, we're not better than these people because we've come after them, and they're not necessarily better than us because they've come uh, before us. Um, we want to look at people with honesty and humility and truth and consider what they had, what they said and who they were and where, how they lived. Um, so that's kind of the perspective we're going to be going with. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a little recap, and then we're going to be talking about Constantine, controversy, and the councils. Let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for all that you are and all that you do for us. Be with us this morning, Lord. Uh, reveal yourself to us. Help us to see and to understand and to look into the past and how you have dealt graciously with your people throughout time. Lord, let truth be lifted up this morning and falsehood fall away. We love you, Lord. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So we're going to do just a little brief introduction and recap. Uh, obviously, we've been talking about church history. Uh, the first weeks, we kind of talked about some reasons, uh, important reasons of why it's good to study church history. Uh, Jim gave a great definition of history and church history. Does anyone remember what that was or have it written down in their notes? If not, that's okay. If you're new, don't worry about it. I will say it in a few seconds. Anybody? Thoughts? No? Uh, the story of, God, of God's faithfulness. That is really good. That's the first part. Um, the story of God's faithfulness in the gospel to his people throughout time. Uh, that's the definition we're ro running with. The story of God's faithfulness in the gospel to his people throughout time. I really like that definition because of God's faithfulness. Um, there's a lot of different ways we can look at church history, but I think that's the best way to do it, with a God-centered focus. Uh, so just to recap, and for our visual learners, I'm going to do a little timeline. My handwriting is pretty bad, so bear with me on that. Uh, so we have about let's say, 30 uh, A.D., when Jesus uh, is crucified and raises again and ascends to the right hand of the Father. And we've kind of been going along and looking at the first 300 years of church history in the past two weeks. Uh, the first week, we talked about God's faithfulness um, through persecution, through persecution. Basically, from about the time of Nero, um, which is about 50 A.D., so 50s, 60s, 70s AD, we have very intense persecution under Nero. And as time goes on, we have various degrees of persecution, up and down. Uh, depending on who was emperor, their thoughts on Christianity, what was going on in the world, those sorts of things. So we'd have very intense persecution for 10, 20 years, then you'd have 50 years of a little bit of a res respite from that sort of thing. All the way up into about the year 300, uh, with the, probably the most severe persecution in the early church under Diocletian. Under Diocletian. Uh, we also talked about um, some of the cultural, geographic, uh, setting, kind of background information of where church history takes pl place. Uh, kind of the culture of the Roman Empire at this time, for this period, um, different types of worship services, um, what the gatherings looked like, what baptism looked like, the Eucharist, uh, which is the Lord's Supper or Communion. So we talked about all of these various things. Um, we also talked about various important figures in theology during this time. We talked about Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Origen, uh, Tertullian, who's my favorite early church father, by the way. He's the best. 
um, a bunch of other people. Um, so people were starting to kind of write down and think about theology, think about what doctrine is and what this faith is. Um, but part of the problem is it's kind of hard to think and have some time to argue about theology uh, when you're being martyred. So there, there was a slow process um, for all of this to take place. Communication was slow, um, and it took a while for people to kind of coify and organize theology as we went through. Uh, and that's kind of what we up to, to today. Uh, today we're going to be kind of continuing. Uh, we're going to be starting at about 300 and moving through uh, the 4th century, which is the 300s, and talking about Constantine, controversy, and councils. Uh, two main themes for today that we're going to talk about is the church and the state, uh, how that relationship changed in this period. Um, as we see these two organizations kind of come into conflict and then come into unity with Constantine, the Edict of Milan, the legalization of Christianity, and a lot of other various factors. And we're also going to be talking about orthodoxy versus heresy. And the question is of how do we guard the truth? Um, how, do, how do we decide what the truth is and then guard it for ourselves in this kind of new age? Um, I think I have a slide. I don't know if Jake has the slide. Uh, it's just a map. It's the same map on your handout. Um, I think it's helpful. I actually got my bachelor's degree in geography, which is useless, but it's fun. Um, so there's a map of kind of the Roman Empire uh, around the time of um, Constantine. All right, so let's talk about Constantine. Our story of Constantine starts about 295 AD. Diocletian is emperor, like we were talking about before. And he kind of has the empire divided into uh, four sections. Um, with him as emperor, and he's kind of divided and given parts of the empire to three other guys to help kind of rule it, kind of in each kind of section. This doesn't really kind of give that idea, but he's kind of split it up uh, that way. One of the leaders, one of the other guys ruling, uh, Galerius is his name, he doesn't like Christians very much. So he decides to try to convince Diocletian to pass some laws against Christians. So we have kind of these escalating persecution, and that's normally how it happens. Uh, Galerius uh, was afraid Christians would abdicate or one, run away from the military uh, because there was a pacifism streak among the church at this time. So that kind of inspired them to kick out Christians from the military and then slowly move away and take their sacred texts and then try to get them to recount their faith. And you have this escalating further and further until you get to imprisonments, beatings, executions. Um, and it became very, very severe, thousands of Christians being executed around this time. Um, in 304, so about 10 years later, uh, Diocletian gets sick. Um, and he decides actually to retire, which is kind of funny. You don't normally think about the emperor retiring, but that's what he does. And during this time, Galerius tries to take over, right? But it doesn't quite work. And that's how it works in Rome. There's a lot of vying factors and people and influences and leaders. And it's such a big area, it's really hard to kind of keep it together. So he, he doesn't really work. He kind of just maintains his own uh, section that he's in charge of, and everyone else kind of keeps their own sections. And that lasts for about 10-ish ten, years. And around uh, 312, right after Galerius dies, Galerius dies, uh, a guy named Constantine, who's in charge of kind of the western part so France, Spain, uh, that part of the western part of northern Africa, England, that area. Uh, he's in charge of that area. He decides this is a good chance for him to make a move, right? So he takes his army and decides to march on Rome, decides to march on Rome. Um, the two armies, they meet just north of Rome at the Battle of Milvian Bridge, the Battle of Milvian Bridge, um, just north of Rome. And this is where kind of a big thing happens for Constantine and for history. Now, Constantine, he's smarter than the guy that's in charge of Rome. Because um, if the guy who's in charge of Rome would have just stayed in Rome where there was giant walls, he probably would have been okay. But he didn't do that. He decided to meet Constantine on the battlefield. But Constantine was also outnumbered. Um, so things could go either way at this point. So as the story goes, um, the eve of the battle of the uh, Milvian Bridge, Constantine either, he's sees in a dream or has a vision in which uh, he gets a command to place a Christian symbol on the shield 
sh all the shields of his men. Um, some say he saw in the sky and he heard the words, in this you will conquer, right? In this you will conquer. So Constantine decides to put this symbol on all of his men's shields and use it as his flag and his standard. Well, the next day he wins the battle. I mean, the battle lasted more than a day, but the, the gist is he wins the battle. Uh, a battle that he might not have won otherwise. So he takes this as a sign that the Christian God, because it was a Christian symbol, um, is for him and has, is powerful. Um, this symbol, uh, which is called the labarum in Latin, we often call it the hero, um, is basically uh, an X with a P superimposed on top of it. So you have key row. So you have a big X with a P on top of it. So something like that. Um, this becomes a very popular Christian symbol. We still see this today. Um, but Constantine will use this symbol for the rest of his uh, life on all of his men and his armies uh, or become a symbol of the Roman Empire. Uh, the Byzantine Empire, a thousand years later, will use this as their main symbol. Um, so this becomes his standard, his flag bearer, um, his, his way to go. And basically what it is, is it's two Greek letters, an X and a P, or a key, which is an X, and a row, which is the P. And this is taken from um, the Greek word for Christ, which is Christos. And the first two letters, Christos, hopefully you can see this okay. Oh, that's a T. Christos. The first two letters are key, row. So that's the idea. Uh, Christos, Christ. All right. So Constantine win the battle, wins the battle with the key row uh, on his soldiers' shields. So he takes his sign, the Christian God is for him. Um, after this victory, uh, he gets together with, a, with another leader of the area, and they issue the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan. And the Edict of Milan might be the single most important event in the history of the church. What it did was it legalized Christianity. It legalized Christianity. And more than that, it gave uh, concessions to Christians. So he wanted to, in the strongest way possible, remove any persecution or hindrance to Christians because their God had allowed him victory. So this is an important date because from this date on, the Christian church and Christians, uh, Christianity was transformed from the perse persecuted people to a favored people, right? This had never happened before in 300 years. Uh, the church had never experienced this. And, and this fact would not change in the West, in our history since then, right? Christianity has been the favored religion of the West, of Europe and America since then. So this is a very foundational point in, in history. This is something that would affect history f for the rest of up till today. Um, and it, what it did and why it's so important is it, it brought the church and the state into a union, right? Into a union. Um, for 300 years, the state and the church were against each other, right? They were in war with each other. Um, there's persecution and fighting. But here we have this church and the state no longer being enemies. This is where the two begin to mesh together. So political power and church power start to merge, right? Church issues and state issues start to merge. The church and the empire start to be viewed as one, as one entity, one idea. So much to the fact that an attack on Rome is viewed as a, an attack on the church. And we can see this idea kind of continuing all throughout history, even up to today, where we have, um, if a Christian nation is attacked, you think Christianity itself is under attack, right? That sentiment is still present with us today. And this is all goes back to the Edict of Milan and the merging of these ideas of church and state together. We also have the merging of, of various pagan practices with Christianity, which can be a problem, obviously. But all of these ideas and this merging starts to happen. Uh, we're going to talk about the effects of this kind of for the rest of the class, but I do just want to list some positives and some negatives um, of the Edict of Milan. The most obvious positive, of course, is no more persecutions, right? Christians aren't being martyred and imprisoned any longer. So that's good. That's very good. Um, the next positive it, uh, is that there's now freedom to evangelize. Freedom to evangelize. Christians have always been evangelistic. And that was one of the problems that the Romans had with Christians, right? Not only were they considered antisocial, like we talked about last week, and they did weird practices, 
but they also tried to convince other people of the truth of their faith, which caused some issues. But now there's freedom to evangelize. There's freedom to evangelize. And there's also time now to develop and discuss and nail down theology. Nail down theology. So that's also a positive. Some negatives. Um, you have the, the concern of a casual faith, of people claiming Christianity uh, for power, for political reasons, for reasons outside of sincere faith. So it becomes difficult to understand or to prove or, or to know if someone is a sincere Christian. You don't have that as much when the threat of death is upon you. Uh, another negative uh, is that there is not only is there time to invest in theology, but there's also time to invent heresy. It's time to invent heresy. So you've got time to think, so you have time to think rightly, and you also have time to think wrongly. So that's another negative. Um, all right. Now, the Christians at this time had a various responses, right? They could see the pros and the cons, just like we can today, right? They were aware. They, were, they knew what was happening, and they, they, they could see it. Um, some even, like, felt that the legalization of Christianity was a negative thing. They didn't agree with it. They didn't want it to happen. Now, that seems weird, but you've got to realize kind of the setting and the background of where they came from. For 300 years, they'd been um, persecuted and martyred, and they viewed this, this persecution as a cleansing of the church. Um, it was a proof of faith. Um, a lot of people even wished to be martyred. That was the goal, to be martyred, right? They would, they would even seek that out. Um, as as uh, Pastor Jim talked about last week, um, Origen wanted to be martyred, and he tried to go out to be martyred, but his mother hid his clothes, so he couldn't leave the house, um, so he would not be martyred. Um, so this is what something to be sought and something to be, to, um, to be honored. It was an honor to be martyred, to suffer as Christ has suffered, right? So to take that away, you lose something. You lose uh, a realness and a genuineness to the Christian faith. Now, Constantine would eventually gain control of the entire empire about 10 years later, um, and he, he would reign. Um, he lived to about 337 AD, 337 AD. But the big question about Constantine, a lot of people consider the Edict of Milan in 312 uh, the conversion of Constantine. Um, the problem is that we don't actually know if Constantine was a Christian. There's a lot of debate, and there's not a lot of evidence to suggest he was a Christian. Now, he would encourage Christianity. He was pro-Christianity. He believed the Christian God was powerful. Uh, he believed that Jesus was powerful. Um, but he was not baptized until on his deathbed. Um, he also would continue the pagan rites of the Roman Empire. He would continue the cult of the emperor. Um, he would continue all of those things and participate them, in them himself. So it's really hard to say where he stood. Um, you can see he's very shrewd political uh, mind. Kind of, he was trying to hold both, both things in his mind, I think. Um, most of the empire was still pagan. Uh, to so completely go into Christianity, I think, would have caused him a lot of trouble and would have prevented his ultimate goal to unify um, all of Rome under him. So we have this kind of back and forth to know whether or not Constantine was actually Christian. Um, any questions or thoughts so far um, that come to mind with any of this? Comments? No? Okay. All right, let's move on from Constantine. Let's talk about controversies and councils. The purpose of the councils, I'm sure many of you heard of the early church, early church councils, was to settle arguments um, within the church and decide what was orthodox and what was not, to decide on right belief and wrong belief. Uh, this is a re direct result of the end of persecution. Priests and bish bishops now had more time to better understand and organize theology, but also more time to come up with bad theology, as I mentioned before. And that's kind of how theology ha has worked throughout history. There really isn't a reason to write things down or spell out doctrine until someone starts doing something weird and wrong. Uh, we need to write down and understand the truth so we can argue against those people, those wrong things. We see this in Paul's letters, where he's writing down theology in order to uh, argue against the Judaizers. Um, Tertullian actually spells out the nature of the Trinity at around the year 200, 200 in order to argue against Praxis, who said that Christ and the Holy Spirit were not really fully God, 
right? So he's, he came up with the idea and the words of the Trinity in order to argue against someone who was disagreeing with the Orthodox already established position. And this is kind of how the councils work, right? They're kind of in this vein. But they were also a result, the councils, of a new ability of the state and the empire to dictate church doctrine and the new political power that the bishops held. So we're going to look at the first four ecumenical councils, the first four. Um, and we're going to talk about kind of two main themes of these first four councils. One theme with the first two and a second theme with the second two. So the first theme is the, the nature of the Trinitarian the Trinity, or the Trinitarian controversy, the Trinitarian controversy. And then the second is trying to argue and understand uh, how Christ can be both human and divine, or the Christological controversy. So those are kind of the two major themes as we, as we kind of work through this. Now really this is just kind of one big theme of understanding who God is. Uh, we kind of talked about this last year when we had a class on who is God. Um, so it was going to similar ideas, similar ideas from that. Um, all right. The direct seeds that lead to the first church council started with an argument between a bishop and a lay leader in Alexandria. In Alexa now, and Alexandria is in Egypt. It's kind of in the bottom there. There are really four big church centers um, in, the, in the ancient world this time. There's Alexandria, Antioch, kind of in Syria, Constantinople, which is in Turkey, and then Rome. Those are kind of the big four. So if you, if you were a bishop of one of those big cities, you were kind of the top dog in the area. So the bishop of Alexandria, whose name was Alexander, which is kind of funny that it works out that way, um, was arguing with a lay leader in his church called Arius. Um, Arius was very popular. He was a very popular lay leader in his church. Uh, he argued with Alexander about the nature of the logos of God which is what they called the second person, the son, the word. Um, they would take in the word logos from the first chapter of John. Uh, so that's the language that they used. Arius believed that the logos, while divine, was not co-eternal with the Father. But he was the first created being. He argued that if the logos was co-eternal with the Father, then there was two gods. Now, we see the same argument a lot all throughout history, even today. This is the argument that Muslims make, that Mormons make against Christians, right? So this is not, you know, this is stuck around a little bit, um, even though they would try to do away with it in the ancient church. Um, the fight between these two, between Alexander and Arius, got so intense that Alexander removed Arius from any positions in the church, essentially excommunicating him. Now, in response... Arius, who was popular and kind of knew lots of people, he sent letters to all of his friends throughout the, throughout the empire, all of his friends. And he kind of rounded up support in Alexandria, right? Uh, people would write jingles in support of his position, right? Just like tunes and sing them around in order to promote the Arian position. Um, and that was a very popular. So Arianism became pretty popular, right? He kind of stirred up support for him. But Alexander was still the bishop. So there was this back and fight, back and forth, fight between them. And at this point, the fight starts to become a nationwide problem, right? He's bringing in all these other people, so Alexander's bringing in all these other people. Um, eventually, it becomes so bad that Constantine, who was emperor at the time, decides to call a meeting to get all this stuff resolved, right? He doesn't want this to blow out. He's, he wants Christianity to bring a unity uh, to the empire, not a disunity. So in 325, he calls the first ecumenical council. First ecumenical council. This is the Nicene Council, or the Council of Nicaea. 325. Now this is a very historic event for a number of reasons, but it was also the first time that the entire church was gathered together in one place. Think about that for a second. Christians from all over come together to talk and meet, right? That's never happened before. Uh, the uh, Christian historian Eusebius, who was there at the time, had this to say of the council. Uh, they were gathered the most distinguished ministers of God from the many churches in Europe, Libya, which was their name for Africa, and Asia. A single house of prayer sheltered Syrians and Sicilians, Phoenicians and Arabs, delegates 
from Palestine and from Egypt, Thebans, Libyans, and together with those from Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq. There was also a Persian who was there, and even a delegate from Spain. So you have a very ecumenical, all the church coming together from all various cultures and regions and geography with different backgrounds and different understandings. Right? What, a, what a great picture that is of the church. Great picture that is of the church. Um, now, because Arius was not actually a bishop, right, he was not allowed into the council. Right? He was not allowed. He was not a leader, so he was not allowed. Um, but he had a representative uh, by the name of uh, Eusebius of Nicomeda. Now, this is a different Eusebius than the historian, different guy. Eusebius was a popular name, I guess. Um, so Eusebius was representing the Arius position. And the Orthodox view was, of course, represented by Alexander. By Alexander. Um, but Alexander would not have a lot of work to do. Would not have a lot of work to do. Uh, many of the bishops from the West, especially, um, didn't really understand the controversy. Uh, they kind of thought it was a waste of time, a lot of them did. They didn't really understand what the big deal was. They thought they would just kind of work it out and it would be fine and they could get to more important issues than this Aryan problem. Uh, they thought the East was kind of arguing over nothing, right? They just kind of held with Tertullian what he said uh, about the Trinity and, and, and that was good for them. That solved the problem 100 years before, they thought. Uh, so they just wanted to move on. Eusebius, from his position, he thought that it would be a simple matter of just arguing his point and stating the facts, and he could get the bishops to agree with him. But it didn't go his way. When the bishops heard that he was arguing for Christ being created, they shouted him down. And some even took his notes from his hands and tore them up and stomped on them. Um, Arianism was completely rejected immediately. Um, so in order to fight against this, they decided that they needed more than just to quote scripture. They need to have a creed to denounce Arianism, a creed to denounce this idea. This is the first creed of Nicaea in 325. The first creed of Nicaea in 325. Um, there's an excerpt in the handout, but I'll, I'll read a section of it. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, the essence, or the usia, of the Father, God of God, light of light, the very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one essence with the Father. Now, later on, it goes on to say, uh, but those who say, this is a direct, you know, this is, so that was their general statement, and at the end they have a paragraph, and this is the, that paragraph at the end, directly against Arianism. But those who say that there was a time when he was not, and he was not before he was made, and he was made out of nothing, or he was of another substance or essence. The Son of God is created or changeable or altered. They are condemned by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So very clear words against Arianism. Uh, those in the camp that refused to sign this creed, right, the Arians mostly, uh, they were actually excommunicated from the church, right? They were kicked out. And Constantine, for good measure, actually had them exiled from their various cities. Right? Exiled from the, this various cities. So very strong stance against Arianism. But it didn't quite stick. It didn't quite stick. Um, Eusebius was a very good politician. And this is, we see this church and state kind of merging here. He was a very good politician and was able to convince Constantine to change his mind. They were actually somewhat friends. Um, so for about 40 years after uh, the First Council of Nicaea, they would argue this position, right? Arians would continue to fight against this position. And when Constantine died, um, there would be a jockeying for position between his successors, again, like we saw before. Um, there's always this fight between who's going to be the next emperor. And depending on who was emperor at the time, one of his kids or um, his second son or his first son, um, one of them would be Arian and one of them would be Nicaean. And so it kind of went back and forth. Um, you had a lot of ups and downs here with Arianism taking the center stage and falling back and then taking it again. But through the tireless effort of Alexander's successor, because Alexander has passed away at this point, Athanasius, uh, and the help of what is called the Cappadocian Fathers, um, we finally get an end to Arianism 
in the Second Council. Uh, to understand kind of how Arianism comes back hard and kind of the back and forth, uh, looking at the life of Ath Athanasius is very helpful. He was uh, Alexander's pupil. He was his understudy. So when Alexander uh, died, Athanasius became the bishop of Alexandria. And he would actually be exiled from Alexandria, Alexandria by various emperors five different times throughout his life. Five different times. So he'd get exiled and go live in the desert with monks and then come back and then get exiled again and back, back and forth. Like another time. And this was his standard, right? This is his soapbox. He would not stop fighting against Arianism throughout his life. Um, finally, we have um, the strongly Nicene-believing uh, Theodosius becomes emperor in about 380. He wanted to settle this matter for, for once and for all. He was done with it. Um, so he called the, the Second Ecumenical Church Council, the Council of Constantinople in 381. 381, Constantinople. Stant. I'm bad at spelling, so. 81. 381. Um, and this was the, the final death nail for Arianism in the church. Uh, they reaffirmed the, the first Nicene Creed completely. Um, the full divinity of Christ was put forth, and they added even um, to the first creed um, to extend full divinity to the Holy Spirit as well. And that section is also the added section to the Nicene Creed is included in the handout. Um, and this would become the Nicene Creed, right? Nicene 2 is what it's called often, or Nicene of 381, Nicene Creed of 381. And this is the creed of Christianity. Um, you cannot be a Christian and not hold the Nicene Creed of 381, right? This is the core of Christianity. If you disagree with that, you are not a Christian. Um, this is all of the church, the Orthodox Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, Protestants, Catholics, everyone. This is, defines the nature of the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, the divinity of the Holy Spirit. All of this is settled, right? So this is done. That argument is complete. But of course, that leads to another argument because there's always another argument for some reason. Uh, any questions about that? Any questions about the first two councils? Um, Athanasius, Arianism, thoughts? Okay. Feel free to shout at me. That's fine. Okay. So now we move on to the second, the next two councils, councils three and four, uh, and our second theme, which is understanding the nature of Christ or the Christological controversy. So now we know that Christ is God and man, right? That's settled. But the question then becomes, how does that actually work, right? How does that make sense? And it's, it's, pr it's a pretty confusing topic. We actually talked about this last year when uh, we talked about the nature of Christ and I taught it, and it's, I still find it very confusing. So that's okay. Um, but we're going to kind of talk about the history and how we go through. Um, there are basically two camps arguing, as there normally is. There is the Alexandrian camp, which is those from Alexandria. Um, and they argued for Jesus' divinity and humility as being in complete unity. Complete unity. Some even argued that his humanity was swallowed up by his divinity. Right? So they're completely one with even the divinity just swallowing up the humanity. So there's this emphasis on divine nature here, right? They want to emphasize the divinity of Christ. Uh, the second camp was those from Antioch. Antioch, which was another big city in Syria. And they wanted to argue for the distinctness between the two natures. They argued that God could not be a baby, and that the natures might not be fully in union, right? They wanted to say that there was a distinction between the two, right? There was human and divine, right? They didn't want to meld them together. And they wanted to emphasize the hum humanity of Christ. They believed that Christ could not be the sacrifice for sin if he was not fully human, which is true. So we have these two kind of camps arguing, right? And um, Gonzalez, who's a historian and has some great books uh, on church history, he, he likes to put forward that this is kind of a false dichotomy that was put forward, right? The early church was very influenced by uh, Greek philosophy. And so there was this kind of didacticism, argumentism between uh, the spiritual, the divine, and the human, right? You can't connect these two. So a lot of theology was done with it. So trying to combine them didn't really work in the minds of us and in the minds of theologians and church leaders at this time. Um, but that's okay. 
and we'll kind of see if how, how this all gets settled. Uh, eventually, another council is called in 331 in Ephesus. So that's the council the, in Ephesus, like the book in the Bible. Um, uh, but because it, there were some issues with the council in Ephesus, there were some issues. Uh, most of the, the Antioch side of the delegates, uh, they were late, right? They were delayed. Um, something happened, so travel wasn't great, so some, they were late. They were about three weeks late. Um, so the Alexandrians decided to just go ahead with the council, right? And they decide on their position and excommunicate all the Antioch followers, and that, then they think it's done. So then, then a couple days later, um, the Antioch camp finally shows up. They figure out what's happened. They decide to have their own council, right? And they excommunicate all the Alexandrians, right? And so it's this kind of back and forth thing. Eventually, um, the emperor kind of steps in and like says, okay, guys, you're, you're being ridiculous here, and kind of shuts it down um, is, is the idea. Is the idea. Um, and kind of what's settled on is kind of a very moderate Alexandrian position. Um, from the Council of Ephesus. Very moderate Alexandrian position. But this didn't really solve anything, as you can guess, right? It wasn't legitimized. There wasn't a lot of consensus. Um, And so in 449, I mean, wait, did I skip it? Yeah, 449, this issue came up again. Uh, And another council is convened in Ephesus. Now, this isn't uh, considered one of the church councils, and, and it was actually called the Robber Council by the Bishop of Rome at the time. And basically what happened is the Alexandrians took control, right? They, they placed themselves as the leader of this council, of this meeting, and they wouldn't allow certain people to speak. And they even had some people beaten up if they tried to, like, fight against them, right? So they were just thugging, like, beating people up to stop them from uh, giving their peace. So it was just, it was all a mess, right? It was all a mess. Um, so this council was just disregarded um, it, 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 and called the robber council. So it's still called that. Uh, thankfully, about a couple years later, uh, they wanted to finally solve this issue. So a new council was called, and this is the fourth ecumenical council, uh, the Council of Chalcedonia in, uh, 451, in 451. And they started by condemning the robber, uh, the robber council and eliminating that as a legitimate council of the church. And the bishop of Rome, whose name was Leo, he sent a letter to be read first at the robber council, but that didn't get read because nobody, nothing got accomplished there. Uh, but he sends it again to this council. And basically, this was just a restatement of what Tertullian had said like 200 years before, right? This was a Tertullian position represented in new words, um, and this was kind of what was accepted by the people. So they liked Leo's, what's called Leo's tome, his letter, um, and, and they kind of accepted his position, and they decided to make a statement or what they called a definition of faith, which was based on Leo's tomb. And they produced this uh, definition of faith. Um, And there's an excerpt in the handout, I believe. And I'll read some of that now. Uh, Our Lord Jesus is one and the same God, perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity, true God and true human, manifested in two natures, without any confusion, change, division, or separation. The union does not destroy the difference of the two natures, but on the contrary, the properties of each are kept, and both are joined in one person and essence. They are not divided into two, but belong to one. So here we see this definition doesn't really answer the question, right? This statement they came up with kind of allows the mystery to exist, right? It says, this is what we know. These are the parameters of what we know. We know that Jesus is fully God, and we know that he is fully man. This is what we know. And they accept this definition, and this becomes the standard um, for the entire church. And that's fine. It's okay to have this mystery, right? It kind of bugs us a little bit, but I think it's okay. There are many things about God that we cannot fully understand, and that's very good. Um, We don't want to understand God fully. If we can understand God fully, he would not be worthy of worship. Um, So this is all right. Um, Like the creeds before, the definition of faith uh, is the standard of Christian doctrine. All Christians hold this position. So those are the first four ecumenical councils and the standard of Christian belief. If you do not hold to these councils, you aren't a Christian, essentially. Um, That's kind of it for that. Uh, In conclusion, um, 
I just want to emphasize kind of the development we see happening here. The connection between church and state, the intermingling of the two, the merging, um, the state having authority over the church, um, the issues of pol politics, power, um, becoming inundated in the church. Uh, it's very important. Um, also the issue of orthodoxy and heresy, how we understand what we believe, why do we believe what we believe, how do we argue that, how do we t determine what is true and what is right.